My name is John Wu, uh, the director of the film. And I'm Mike Werb. I'm Michael Kaleri. And we're the writers. <laughs> so welcome to the 10th anniversary of Face Off's existence, I guess. One thing we just wanted to say is this music starts, which always gives us a little chill, is uh, we're really proud that we have John Powell's first feature length motion picture credit. It's a beautiful score. Mike, what was the song that was the placeholder for this music? The Louis Armstrong, um, What a Wonderful World, I believe. That worked really well, too, but John Powell, man, he pulled it out for this. I must say that to work on this project is like a, like a dream, a dream come true, you know. So I remember uh, the first time I got a script was uh, in 1993 from uh, Mr. Joe Silver. I really loved the script. It had a great concept and a fantastic design, you know. But I had the problem to make a sci-fi movie so that because uh, so I passed it because I didn't think I could do a good job and I need to learn more, you know, need to learn more about the uh, special effect and, and the, the CG, you know, all the kind of stuff. And then after two or three years later when I was uh, shooting Broken Arrow, then the project, you know, they, uh, they come up to me again. And then the, the producer changed to Michael Douglas and Steve Ruther. And then they approached that idea to meet again, you know. So I was uh, deeply surprised, you know, because I, and I couldn't believe uh, I could work with uh, Michael Douglas, you know, because I have long admired uh, Michael's work, you know. I admire him as a great producer, great actors, and great filmmakers. So, um, you know, yeah, he had made uh, such a famous movies like uh, Went Through Over the uh, Coconut and uh, China Syndrome. And that, uh, that was become one of my dream to work with uh, Mr. Michael Douglas. <laughs> so, and then that, um, and then, and when I read the script again, and uh, it had made a lot of changes. It became more of a thriller, and the science fiction was taken out. Uh, they took out uh, a lot of uh, sci-fi stuff, and uh, make it into a human drama, and uh, with uh, a lot of uh, great action, you know. And then I love it, but I still suggest uh, to make the movie more of an emotional, and then they all agreed with me, and then uh, so they asked uh, Mike and Michael to make another change. So the story, first it was a wonderful script, and then it had uh, great producers, and it gave me a lot of uh, confidence. One of the things that I remember that Michael Douglas also said to <laughs> us was, you know, probably after he talked to you or maybe Joel, but was that, uh, you know, do we need to set it so far in the future? I mean, as an actor, he also understood that the human drama was the most important thing, too. So I think you and Michael really saw eye to eye about that, and that gave us a, a, a yet another challenge for doing a rewrite for both of you. Yeah, even though I haven't made a lot of, uh, you know, action movies, but I do love human drama, you know, and uh, like... Uh, in my Hong Kong movie, uh, A Bell Tomorrow, uh, The Killer, A Bullet in the Head, you know, it looks, uh, basically, it looks uh, pretty human, you know. Well, it, maybe it's worth saying that the carousel, that scene had taken place later in the script, and one of John's first notes was to put it closer to the front of the movie. Mm. And, uh, again, to ground the story, the human story, at the very beginning and what was bothering Archer. One of the things we learned from John quite a bit while making this movie was that for the first several months in pre-production, all John wanted to do was talk about the emotion and the characters and not about the action at all because he knew he was going to not have a problem with that. But it was definitely a huge learning experience for Michael and I to uh, have John sort of shepherd us and, and shepherd the emotion through even all the action sequences. Fingers, nothing happens. You know, that's the way I'm working with my actors. You know, I like them, you know, to put their true emotion and, and real feeling into the scene or into the character. And I also let the actor have a lot of a creative freedom. I let them free to do whatever they want. 
you know, so while we're shooting the scene, you know, the, the, when John was seeing his son uh, got killed, you know, I just uh, talked to John, you know, if it is your own son, I know he loved his son very much, you know, and then I asked him, if your son got hurt or, you know, or is, if he's dying, you know, what will you feel? Uh, what did you do, you know? And he said to me, you know, I will, uh, you know, hold him tight and put his hand against my heart, you know. I said, okay, let, let's do that, you know. It's very touching, you know. So John, you know, he really gave his uh, true emotion when he's holding the baby, you know, that the little boy tight, you know, it really uh, made me cry, you know, at that moment. There's Nick doing his thing. It was great working with Nick. I truly admire him as a great actor, you know. I, I love his movie, uh, Living uh, Las Vegas. He had a wonderful performance, you know, and there was a one more dream to working with Nick. One of the reasons why we wrote this movie in the first place was there were just too many action films in which the bad guy was uninteresting. And we started off talking about doing an action film in which the bad guy was every bit as interesting as the good guy, and it kind of <laughs> it morphed from there into this. We were trying to establish the very iconically the difference between these two men. One is very tight and, you know, anal retentive, and the other is very uh, is bigger than life. And, you know, he smokes and he swears and he womanizes, and the other rarely even has sex with his wife. We had to go big with that because once they flipped places, it needed to be easy for the audience to follow. And fortunately, we got those two actors who could play off each other. And, and now, John, this was the famous shot where the jacket <laughs> blew up. How did, how did you accomplish that? Well, actually, the idea was came from uh, Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> okay. There was one moment uh, when uh, Peter O'Toole put on the uh, Arab rope, and uh, he was, you know, walking on the top of the train, and the wind blow his rope, you know, so he looks so elegant and charming. So I just want to make a charming devil, you know, okay? So I, uh, I just want to do the same scene, you know, for Nick. So we have a special make of a, a, a black rope. Actually, the rope was made uh, by silk, so it's uh, easily blown by the wind. And I saw where he got out of the car and, and his rope was blown by the wind and it was by accident. And that wasn't what I really want. What I want is uh, after he got out of the car, when he walked to work to uh, his brother and, and the huge wind blew up his uh, whole rope, you know. But unfortunately, we were shot against the uh, strong wind and the real wind was uh, blowing, uh, you know, uh, from his back. And uh, we couldn't get that moment. But uh, fortunately, we have got a little piece, of, you know, while, while he's getting out of, uh, out of the car, you know. So, but it still worked, you know, and, and that shot uh, became a, <laughs> one of my classic shots in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Nate came up with the idea of uh, putting his two gun on his back, and uh, he loved Chinese culture, and he was believed he, were, he was born in the year of a dragon. So he loved a dragon, and then he also had suggested to carve the dragon, you know. Uh, oh, in the box. On the gun. So, and uh, we have a special made uh, two uh, golden gun with the uh, dragon, you know, on it. So it makes uh, his character so much special. I think, uh, you know, at the, uh, Nick is a very creative and clever actor. So he always uh, came up with some little thing, some great idea, you know, try to make the character much more dynamic and lovable, you know. And also his idea was uh, nearing down to a title of the, uh, his brother's uh, Suicidist, you know. Another dream was uh, really surprised me. I, I couldn't believe I could work with John Trafoda, you know. It's, uh, he was uh, one of my idols. I'm sure everyone will remember how great he was in uh, Saturday Night Fever, you know. And there was so much crazy about him. He was, uh, and uh, we, we love him, we admire him, you know, and we also imitate him, you know. I also uh, imitate how he danced. And I was, uh, you know, I was dancing like John Travolta. <laughs> and uh, after, uh, you know, 15 or 20 years, uh, I, and I couldn't believe I could work with my idol. You know? <laughs> so it was uh, one of the joy for me for working in the film. And he was so kind and so lovable.
and he also was, was very funny as well. You know, <laughs> he always you know talk about jokes and and he always try to make everybody happy. When I make a face off, since I've got so much pressure, I, I never smile on a set. You know, whenever I you know at the, you know, work on it, look at a real finder or, or working on something, he always came up to me and he tapped on my shoulder. He said, John, it's only a movie, you know? <laughs> he said, uh, be happy, you know? I said, life is beautiful. Don't give yourself too much pressure. And then he talked, you know, some funny thing to try to make me happy, you know? And then uh, he always made me feel relaxed, so much relaxed working with him. I was so grateful to work with John as well. It's true what John says. I mean, Travolta knew everyone's name and was always in a good mood. And mm. he, if he saw someone with a glum face, he'd always try to, you know, pick them up and tell a joke or do an imitation of anyone, Barbara Streisand, Jimmy Cagney. He could do it all. Well, when he came back on the camera, he was so serious. <laughs> <laughs> I love to make fun action, you know, I, I love making action sequences, you know, when we, uh, I remember when we were shooting the scene, we have used six cameras, we have separated the two groups, one was uh, directed by uh, second unit director Billy Burton, and he shot, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, the uh, stunt double scene and the car chase and the plane, you know, crash all the, all the scene for me. And then we also have the, the brilliant stunt coordinator, Brian Smith. He's a, such a fine young man and he, had, he knows everything and, and he designs all the action strips. And by the meantime, I shot another scene at another corner, like, uh, like the scene, you know, the uh, Nick get out of the car and blow by the wind, you know, out of the scene. So, and we had a very tight schedule. We need three days uh, to shoot the, the whole sequence. Mm. So we have to split the two units to cut them all. Well, here, this is the thing, <laughs> John. Talk about that. Even though we had the story about the whole scene, but I still, you know, made a lot of changes on the, on the set because I had never believed in the storyboard. The storyboard, you know, it tell the story, but it had never satisfied me, you know. So uh, I like to shoot the whatever I come up with. No, like you have spontaneous ideas yeah, yeah, on yeah. the set. What the fuck are you doing? We really loved how beautiful it looked. It was very exciting being out in Barstow uh, watching all this be shot. I mean, we were like, oh my God, this is madness. Many we times in the six months of this production, Mike and I would look at each other and say, they do know it's about face swapping, right? <laughs> oh, I always wanted to ask you, you know, the JW that was on the pilot, did they put that in for you? Yeah, somebody trying to make fun with me. Because <laughs> on the steering wheel yeah, yeah, of the, the plane, yeah. it says JW. We always wondered yeah, if that was for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't remember it was Nick's idea or, or somebody else's idea. You know, this is because, you know, at that moment, they all um, familiar with my Hong Kong movies. And, they, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. maybe. So uh, they love to work with me, you know. So that's why they put a JW on the uh, steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, either maybe the uh, producer or the uh, or, or, the ne or Neil Spizak, maybe. Yeah, 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 Neil Spizak. <laughs> yeah. So I've got a lot of friends uh, by working on this movie. You know. Uh, Loomis, the FBI agent Loomis's ear getting blown off right here that Margaret Cho just reacted to was very crucial to the setup of the buy into the surgery for the audience because we repair the ear later in the movie and we see what they can do. We see what the plastic surgeons in this black ops clinic can do. Once we see how perfect the ear is repaired, that scene, we had to fight for that scene with the studio a bit. Once that happens, we get the buy-in to the face swapping. That's exactly right. Sure 